So we're very excited to have Dr. Steve Jonas here with us today from Department of Pediatrics. Um, Steve was trained as um, a physician scientist with um, very impressive interdisciplinary background. He got his um, PhD in material science and engineering, um, and then his MD, um, followed by pediatric residency training and fellowship in pediatric hematology and oncology. And um, during his PhD thesis uh, research, he, um, he became uh, expert in fabrication and characterization of nanoscale materials and service chemistries, which then he optimized for um, uh, studies and culturing um, of human pl pluripotent stem cells uh, and their derivatives. Um, and that laid the groundwork for um, his academic career um, right now as a pediatric hematologist and oncologist. And his current research program uh, uh, focuses on um, basically designing and applying uh, nanosystems and um, broadly applicable methods that ensure the safe and rapid delivery of therapeutic biomolecules and genome editing machinery, which is clearly very crucial for immunotherapy. And so I think he's gonna to talk to us today about how he's applying these uh, strategies to uh, treating COVID. And I also wanna mention that Steve is very talented um, and he received, a, um, he received a Young Investigator Award from Alex Lemonade and the NIH Director's Early Independence Award. So we're very excited to um, hear about um, uh, your updates on your COVID projects. And please take it away, Steve. Well, thanks, Melody, for uh, that super kind introduction. And uh, thanks to the BSCRC and the COVID Research Oversight Committee for uh, the invitation to you know, maybe pose a couple of questions and, and share some of our work with you today. Um, just a quick flash uh, of our usual disclosures relating to IP related to our research program, uh, some of which is now actually being licensed uh, to a company that's being spun off by the UCLA Technology Development Group, which uh, I guess we're calling Transfecta Biosciences. So it's kind of a cool name. It's a little crazy to think about that at, at this stage of my career. Um, but uh, uh, you know, honestly, as a, as a, a new investigator coming out of training uh, at the start of this year, uh, I was really excited to begin to grow our team uh, that's really been focused, as, as Melody said, on uh, developing and testing uh, different types of nanotechnology enabled methods uh, that target applications within the gene and cellular therapy spaces, uh, as well as in developing liquid biopsy inspired cancer diagnostic platforms. Then is, you know, is not really a mystery to uh, everyone on the Zoom call. Uh, we've uh, had to pivot kind of pivot kind of quite a bit uh, with our plans um, uh, with the emergence of SARS-CoV-2 and 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 uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus and 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 dealing with uh, kind of the clinical the, the clinical manifestations of the disease that causes COVID-19. Um, and so my apologies if this is a little bit of an aside, but um, uh, as you know the pandemic had has evolved and you know we were talking about. Uh, clinical service earlier. I remember being on call at Ronald Reagan during the week that we all ramped down uh, and being completely scared out of my mind that we wouldn't have enough PPE to last us the week. And so it's been a, re a really an, a amazing to see the collaborative partnerships that have uh, coalesced so rapidly uh, between uh, different parts of the university from uh, bioengineering and medical students coming together to laser cut uh, uh, face masks for essential workers. And, and, and honestly, thank God no one ever needed uh, uh, to be uh, placed on a ventilator with parts 3D printed from one of the, the 3D printers in our lab. Uh, and of course, obviously, the, the, the progressive ramping up of testing efforts uh, throughout the health system, the community, and, and on campus that uh, both Valerie Arboleta and, and Grace Aldrovani uh, really hydra highlighted in their talks at the seminar series. Um, Early on, uh, we were we were asked uh, if we could uh, make uh, our three D printers available to produce uh, nasal pharyngeal uh, testing swabs in anticipation for potential shortages, uh, as uh, testing needed to be ramped up. And uh, uh, we were obviously happy to to help and, and play our very very tiny part uh, here. But uh, uh, so on a dime, we we basically set out to really reverse engineer and design our own swabs from the ground up. And this is effort in our lab. Uh, that was spearheaded by uh, Jay Park, a very talented postdoc working with me, who's uh, an absolute wizard with 3D modeling and printing. And within three days, Jay uh, had prototypes of uh, different uh, swabs that were printed using autoclave of materials with different tip configurations from honeycomb type tips to triple helixes to chain mail. There was 
since even this mascara uh, uh, version. And I even learned my new favorite word of quarantine and discussions with, with, with Grace and one of our, the fellows in our division, Ashley Gray, about trying to figure out the right and proper amount of flocculation uh, required for, uh, 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 to get an, an adequate sample. And so from positioning uh, locations of breakpoints uh, to mechanical testing uh, cons and, and cons considering moves from nasal pharyngeal to mid-turbinate uh, swab configurations to adding stoppers so you don't just jam it up uh, uh, too far up your nose, which you know I'm sure uh, can happen with, uh, with what's going on on campus these days. Um, uh, it's, it, it was really a fun challenge. Um, it turns out though that you know, fortunately for patients who are being tested, but maybe unfortunately for us when, when trying to design a swab from scratch, that there was really never enough positive uh, patient samples that could be made available to, to validate the swabs officially. I think you see, need something like 30 independent samples uh, to, to, to really uh, uh, make a, uh, to, to validate a swab for these types of purposes. And, and of course, we understand that the priorities needed to be shifted to, uh, uh, to bigger and more important efforts. Uh, and I know this is a little bit off topic for uh, what we're, uh, uh, for what's going to be the rest of my talk, but I only uh, mentioned this, this this tiny project today here uh, because it's, this is kind of my really my one and only chance uh, to really thanks folks thank folks in my group, uh, particularly Jay uh, for being so accommodating of their time and their creative energy uh, to completely shift their work up to this project, uh, which ultimately required a lot of work. And you know we're uh, we won't be uh, patenting these designs. We won't be publishing them anywhere. Um, no press releases or anything uh, of the sort. But uh, we wanted to make these uh, these designs available to anyone who needs them. And, and honestly, uh, you know, I think I think we have a, something like a surplus of a thousand of these swabs sitting on a bench somewhere in our lab. If anyone ever needs them. Um, uh, but with that being said, um, having kind of uh, hit on the protective equipment and and the testing. Uh, I wanted to shift gears a little bit uh, and talk a little bit about treatment. Uh, and obviously, uh, we're we're hoping for uh, uh, good news on the on the vaccine front, uh, hopefully in the in, in the somewhat near future. Uh, but from a therapeutic standpoint, as we all know, uh, uh, discussions have really focused on on primarily on how to repurpose different agents uh, that yield antiviral effects uh, by impacting uh, different points in the viral life cycle or stem the tide of uh, cytokine release that occurs in severe COVID-19 cases, uh, which can ultimately result in massive capillary leak and ultimately ARDS and, and, and obviously uh, uh, potentially uh, mortality. Um, uh, and honestly, outside of you know, big politicians having access to you know, the kitchen sink of these interventions, uh, for the most part, uh, average patient uh, the, to the average patient, um, uh, clinical management has primarily been supportive. And so, you know, many folks have, have also posed the question of whether or not uh, engineered cell therapies uh, uh, can provide an option for uh, caring for COVID-19 patients, um, uh, or whether or not we might be able to learn um, from the recent experience in deploying these types of therapies to manage severe uh, COVID-19 symptoms. Uh, this is particularly the case for adoptive cellular therapies, uh, which have uh, been obviously applied, uh, and there's great interest in applying them in, 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 in the treatment of different malignancies, but have also been uh, utilized uh, to produce viral-specific effector cells uh, in the post-solid uh, organ transplant, uh, as well as the uh, Thanapoetic stem cell uh, transplant populations. So, um, you know, it really begs the question: uh, Is there really a role for cellular therapeutics in the management of COVID nineteen? And you know, honestly, uh, I don't know uh, that answer. And I'm clearly not an immunologist, as you'll you'll see, you know, as we get further along on this talk. Uh, but uh, we're an infectious disease expert. Uh, but there, uh, there are interesting possibilities, I think, uh, particularly in the application of as, as, as of, of viral specific uh, T cells uh, that uh, you know have been generated uh, either using um, antigen specific uh, uh, T cells uh, using uh, uh, major hepiso major histo compatibility uh, 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 multimers cytokine capture approaches as well as ex vivo. Uh, expansion methods following antigen stimulation that have uh, enabled in, in the in the post BMT populations uh, off the shelf pools of cells uh, from healthy donors. Um, NK cell based approaches have also been discussed in previous seminars in this series uh, that have uh, uh, that may be applied to you know potentially uh, replace uh, reduced or or circulating uh, 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 reduced. Uh, 
replace reduce circulating and K cell numbers or to really just augment uh, exhausted or dampened uh, NK cell responses that are seen in severe uh, COVID-19 infections uh, that may also contribute uh, ultimately to uh, impeding uh, appropriate viral clearance. And so, uh, you know, this is technically not an engineered cell therapy, but I, I just include this slide because it highlights how, uh, you know, as uh, from a bioengineering perspective, there may be other approaches that can be used to, to make what I think about as kind of pseudo cell therapies. And this is work from uh, Langfang Zhang's uh, uh, group at, at UCSD, uh, where uh, their team uh, developed a, a neat little approach that they call a nano sponge, where uh, they take polymeric nanoparticles and wrap them uh, with cell membrane components from either macrophages or, 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 or type two lung alveolar cells that can present uh, ACE2. And they use them essentially to uh, uh, soak up uh, circulating viral particles in in vitro models of, of, of SARS-CoV-2 infection. And I thought that was kind of a neat approach just to kind of add as an aside. But getting back on topic, um, adoptive immunotherapies uh, leverage um, that really leverage viral specific T cells have been applied in uh, the care uh, of immunocompromised, immunocompromised patients with a variety of uh, viral infections in the post uh, transplant setting uh, in uh, uh, or even in, 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 in the setting of primary, in patients with primary immunodeficiencies with uh, a clinical track record of uh, something on the order of 20 years. Um, uh, in this experience, there are, 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 are several cases of complete response and reduction in viral loads in patients with, with uh, 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 suffering from treatment refractory CMV infections, as well as you know, other common transplant associated viral infections such as EBV, BK, HHV6, and adenovirus. Um, so honestly, it was only a matter of time before we saw uh, this approach applied to, to SARS-CoV-2 and, and, and actually a paper, uh, uh, in a paper that actually went online just a couple of days ago, I think uh, this past Tuesday, in blood from Kat Baller's group, um, uh, she and her colleagues demonstrated that um, uh, viral specific T cells could uh, be a, 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 a ex vivo expanded um, from a cohort of 27 convalescent patients uh, that were uh, for following their recovery from a COVID from COVID-19 infections. And what I found was, that was interesting from from uh, their epitope mapping of uh, the primarily CD4 uh, positive T cell populations isolated um, uh, um, uh, in this work was that they, they could that, that the T cells essentially could recognize multiple immuno uh, dominant uh, epitopes within the, the SARS-CoV-2 spike membrane and nucleoplasmid proteins, but that uh, the viral specific T cells that they collected uh, from their patient cohort, uh, interestingly, predominantly possessed targeting specificity, uh, primarily to the membrane protein, which uh, is interesting to me because you know in 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 in, in many respects most efforts uh, are have been uh, focused on targeting the spike protein. So maybe there is uh, some potential implications um, um, for this work in 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 designing different types of of, of uh, T cell based therapeutics uh, 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 directed at at SARS CoV two, um, but. Uh, ultimately, I think uh, you know the main message uh, for me in, in this work is that while a, a small sample, uh, while it's a small sample size, this work does take us a, a step further along the road to potentially banking viral-specific T cells uh, for some clinical uh, uh, indications related to COVID-19. And so there are a number of uh, CAR and K cell uh, solutions that are also being explored that show specificity for for SARS-CoV-2. Um, some of them have been talked about um, at, at previous uh, uh, iterations of this seminar, but this is just one example from a group at Rutgers uh, uh, that, 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 uh, that show one potential uh, uh, cell therapy product. Um, and in all of this discussion, you know, I think the elephant in the room is uh, uh, whether these cells, uh, uh, whether uh, these types of therapies might actually uh, stoke the flames of cytokine release seen in severe uh, COVID-19 cases, especially given the overlap uh, that we see in the cytokine profiles uh, in, in COVID-19 uh, and in those in, uh, uh, who are uh, in, in patients post CAR T cell trial therapy. And that's really opened the door uh, to consider how we might best repurpose agents uh, used in, in treating CRS in, in the CAR T cell uh, population, in, in CAR T cell patients, uh, such as IL-6 uh, receptor modulation with tocilizumab, uh, JAK inhibitors, uh, or JAK inhibitors really to kind of to try and tamp down uh, CRS uh, in, in, in severe cases. 
and also again to sprinkle in a, a little bit of uh, potential bioengineered engineered strategies. Uh, I thought that this this work from uh, our colleague uh, Zhang Gu um, uh, from bioengineering was uh, was particularly a, a neat kind of approach where uh, uh, they utilized essentially. Um, uh, platelet derived extracellular vesicles that uh, were that could be loaded with a TCP1A, which is a, uh, a potent uh, IKK2 inhibitor, uh, which uh, uh, they showed uh, can uh, reduce uh, cytokine profiles um, in, uh, in, in mouse models of acute lung injury um, in uh, a recent publication in Matter. Um, so all of this is, is all really well and good, uh, but uh, what will ultimately hamper uh, an off-the-shelf cell therapy solution for 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 COVID-19, and in, in our eyes, is uh, are really the logistics uh, of the expense and the speed at which um, cell therapies can be manufactured and deployed, uh, and, and using you know, existing using existing methods. And so, uh, you know, honestly, COVID-19 patients uh, can't wait the weeks it, it currently takes uh, to generate uh, cell doses uh, of CAR T cells for, for oncology patients. And obviously, um, it's kind of impractical to uh, charge upwards of, uh, of half a million dollars a dose. And so our, our group uh, has really been interested in finding solutions to these issues, because um, uh, in the end, uh, Mass producing engineered uh, CARS T cell, uh, uh, engineered cell, cell therapy products uh, uh, becomes a, ultimately a question of identifying uh, the appropriate therapeutic tar cargos, uh, packaging them efficiently, and then delivering them to relatively large populations of cells um, efficiently, rapidly, efficiently, and uh, sorry, efficiently, rapidly, safely, and cost effectively. And you know, uh, in our minds, you know, we we kind of like to joke that sometimes you want to deliver the traditional way. Sometimes uh, in the near future, we want to use drones. And so we're hoping to be kind of the Amazon uh, of, of 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 this field uh, to uh, uh, develop these types of tools um, uh, to enable uh, rapid deployment of these therapies in, in different settings. In terms of the cargo, like I said before, uh, I'm not really an immunologist, and, and, and the, the cargos are a bit out of my wheelhouse, but luckily there are efforts on campus uh, led by uh, folks like Chris Seat and Gay Crooks uh, that offer opportunities to screen for uh, potential uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, directed uh, T cell receptors uh, that can uh, really hopefully inform the design of pot uh, a pot a potential uh, transgene constructs used to engineer SARS-CoV-2 directed T cell uh, based immunotherapeutics. Uh, Chris, uh, you know, already uh, went over uh, their strategy in his talk, and I don't really want to repeat what he's already said or really butcher their work. But you know, from my very simplistic understanding, they've essentially developed a a single uh, antigen expressing type one conventional uh, dendritic cell uh, that's they can derive from hematopoietic stem cells uh, that is able to present all possible epitopes of, uh, for example, the spike antigen, the S antigen uh, to um, uh, autologous T cells uh, in, uh, uh, in, in in vitro models. And this, in, in these models uh, essentially uh, allow them to um, uh, simulate the interaction between naive T cells and, and these dendritic cells in, in lymph nodes following primary immunization. And uh, then essentially tease out uh, and screen for uh, TCRs uh, that uh, might be used to generate cargos uh, 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 for us in the future, we hope, or you know other applications. Um, you know, while we're waiting for you know potential uh, TCR transgene cargos to be identified uh, through this screening effort, uh, Chris recently asked us to see if we might be able to to help him visualize this interaction uh, between the, the the dendritic cells and the T cells a little bit better. And he showed a couple of uh, initial scanning electron microscopy images uh, that 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 Gail uh, has been taking um, uh, in collaboration with Si Wen from from his group uh, uh, during his talk, uh, where you know the activated dendritic cells uh, essentially adopt this kind of what we're calling kind of a sunburst or, or, or nest-like configuration. And in co-cultures uh, with naive T cells, we're starting to see them coming together uh, and, and nest together, um, which we're, we're trying to understand and, and, and figure out ways to better visualize and probe this immune synapse uh, using different types of super resolution techniques. And so hopefully um, uh, these types of, uh, this type of information will be helpful um, for folks like, uh, uh, like 
for folks like Chris in, in, in really uh, developing and optimizing the cargos uh, that uh, are gonna be essential for, for creating these types of therapies in the future. So that essentially covers the cargos, but what about packaging? And so together with HR Seng, we've explored uh, the use of supermolecular uh, nanoparticle systems that uh, can uh, self-assemble into dendromer uh, nets, essentially, around uh, biomolecular cargo using host gas chemistries uh, between uh, adamantane and cyclodextin uh, groups that uh, are present on uh, these molecular building blocks. Uh, the advantages of, of, of this system is that both nucleic acids and proteins can be loaded into, uh, into the particles relatively straightforwardly, and, and the resulting particles can be incorporated uh, with you know, different types of functionalities from uh, cell penetrating peptide sequences or nuclear clear localization sequences to improve tra trafficking uh, uh, upon delivery. And so we've applied, uh, begun to apply these supermolecular uh, nanoparticles to deliver gene editing reagents in a variety of systems. Uh, in these cases, we tend to employ a, a two particle system to keep the particles within a, an appropriate size around less than a 200 uh, nanometers, uh, where you know, one set of, uh, uh, of, 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 the, of the nanoparticles is, is, is loaded with a, a Cas9 encoding plasmid uh, in this case, and, and another is a, a, a uh, contains a, a donor template, uh, in this case, encoding for uh, uh, the retinoschisin 1 gene, which uh, deficiencies of which can lead to retinal diseases like Liber hereditary optical neuropathy. And um, using microfluidic approaches to um, uh, optimize the, the synthesis of the particles, we can combinatorially um, optimize cargo configuration and type, uh, the amount of the self penetrating peptide sequence and functionality and the ratios of the different molecular building blocks to identify formulations that uh, yield optimal transfection efficiencies. And this, uh, in, in this case, to, to mass retinal cells, uh, which we recently reported in, in, in advanced sciences a couple of months ago. Uh, and more recently, we've adapted uh, these types of particles to house in, in entire Cas9 uh, ribonuclear protein complexes uh, rather than the plasmid constructs to enable homology directed repair mediated, mediated introduction of the human of human beta globin genes to uh, this to a safe harbor locus in uh, k562 3.21 uh, uh, cells which harbor the the sickle cell mutation and you'll notice uh, that the uh, uh, the silicon nanowires that we use to help uh, uh, deliver uh, the particles into the cells uh, have this uh, uh, randomly or ordered or barbed wire uh, like appearance uh, that we're ultimately trying to improve, uh, which we'll we'll uh, uh, we'll talk about in a couple of slides. Uh, but this, the point here is that uh, with these super molecular nanoparticles, um, we uh, we have uh, this uh, the system really gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of the packaging, uh, uh, the packaging of, of potentially uh, different types of, of SARS-CoV-2 directed TCR encoding cargos um, or other gene editing uh, types of constructs uh, in the future uh, that you know, potentially might enable us to, um, uh, for example, target disruption of the track locus for potential off-the-shelf uh, type cell, uh, cell therapy solutions uh, um, in this setting. And so, you know, in addition to, to that work, we're also looking at, 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 at uh, packaging strategies for uh, triggering the, the release of cargo from nanoparticles using a variety of stimuli, uh, such as uh, the application of, of alternating magnetic fields to basically push out cargo from, from the nanoparticles. And this is work uh, that's uh, from a student to be Dr. Shan Zhang, who's a uh, an amazing visiting graduate student who's uh, been working with us over the past couple of months, uh, who's actually heading home to China uh, uh, this weekend, actually, uh, to defend her dissertation. And so um, we, we were hoping that, you know, developing these types of capabilities enable uh, us uh, to essentially time the release of certain cargoes in situations where, you know, constructs may need to be processed uh, by certain cell types in, in a sequence. And so um, uh, th these types of uh, 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 projects give us, uh, uh, give us the, 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 that versatility in, in terms of how we deliver cell, to deliver to the cells of interest. Um, so that's the cargos, uh, and, and now that if we can hopefully properly package them, how do we best deliver them? And so uh, for most clinical grade uh, cellular uh, therapeutic applications, uh, viral vectors have really been the mainstay of, of this type of work when producing um, uh, engineered cell products. And while you know you see you have you attain decently reliable 
while while they are, while these systems are tend to be decently reliable, uh, they tend to fall short in terms of the speed and the expense, uh, uh, those all important factors that we talked about in terms of needing, uh, you need to for rapidly deploying uh, uh, these types of therapies in, in situations like, uh, like the current pandemic. And so non-viral based approaches such as electroporation and, and, and lip affection similarly suffer from uh, uh, issues with poor, with potentially poor viability, cell type, or instrument in de uh, instrument dependence, and and, and ultimately in, in 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 the cases of chemical transfection uh, 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 type uh, systems, uh, issues with scalability uh, to meet uh, uh, manufacturing demands. And so, more recently, there are bi uh, there are biophysical approaches such as mechanical cell squeezing that offer fast and efficient intracellular delivery solutions, uh, but uh, which can ultimately suffer from issues with biofouling that can hinder uh, sustainable manufacturing. And so in our mind, you know, an ideal uh, technology for uh, manufacturing a cell therapy has to satisfy a couple of things, particularly in terms of uh, GMP compliance upfront or, uh, or compatibility upfront, having uh, universal cargo delivery, being agnostic to cell types, have uh, high efficiency, high throughput, minimal cytotoxicity, sustainable operation, and, and ultimately can be scalable. And this remains a long-term challenge in, the, in this space. And so we're actively developing uh, a portfolio of different nanotechnology enabled methods uh, to support uh, cell therapy manufacturing uh, to uh, begin to address these challenges that either use sharp nanostructures uh, that can be used to basically penetrate um, uh, into cell membranes or biophysical uh, membrane permeabilization strategies on, uh, that are based on rapid membrane deformation. And I only have uh, time to really talk about the, the, the top three uh, in, in, in this panel, uh, but uh, I, I would highlight um, some interesting work from uh, Aram Chung's group uh, from Korea University, who's actually a, a former postdoc of Dino DiCarlo from bioengineering here, uh, who has some really cool work uh, uh, recently in, in developing uh, what are called hydrodynamic systems, where cells are essentially mechanically manipulated as they pass through uh, intersecting fluid streams. Uh, in terms of the nanostructure-based uh, uh, projects that we're working on, uh, as I said a couple of slides ago, we're, we're moving away from substrates that are, are, are comprised uh, of, of randomly ordered nets of, of of, of silicon nanowires uh, uh, to explore more ordered arrays of, 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 uh, of nanoneedle-like uh, uh, nano -needle -like, uh, features that can uh, essentially, uh, that act uh, basically less like barbed wire and, and more like, uh, I, I kind of like to say everyone's favorite high school uh, physics experiment uh, where we can distribute the load of cell experiences uh, as it makes contact uh, with uh, the tip of the, the nano needle uh, to minimize damage um, and uh, maintain uh, uh, cellular proliferation. Uh, uh, here, the premise, and you know, this is uh, 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 in honor of you know, obviously the Lakers winning the championship this year, uh, is that it, it's sort of like uh, we want to make systems where we are sort of like dribbling a basketball, uh, where we can integrate uh, needles, uh, the nano needles uh, substrates um, whose tips are essentially decorated uh, with supermolecular nanoparticle packages within microfluidic networks, uh, that we can uh, then uh, tailor to enable us to dribble the cells along uh, 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 the needles and pick up the packages at each point of contact. Uh, to accomplish this, uh, we really leveraged uh, precision nanomanufacturing capabilities uh, developed uh, in our group uh, during uh, uh, my postdoc with Paul Weiss that we uh, that give us control over the shape and configuration of the nanostructures uh, uh, that, that, uh, that we use to interact with the cells. And in initial attempts to deliver plasmids encoding for a CD19 uh, targeting uh, chimeric antigen receptor to human uh, T cell populations as an initial kind of model to cargo, um, uh, we were encouraged actually to see some uh, some, some transfection um, that um, uh, and that this method you know seems to be uh, less harsh. Um, on the cells relative to conventional non-viral delivery approaches, um, while also being uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat uh, have a, a somewhat uh, fast throughput in terms of being able to process about 20 million cells an hour. 
And so, uh, you know, I admit that, you know, there is a lot of room uh, for improvement with some of these numbers. Uh, and, and we're looking at, uh, actively to evaluate different types of nanostructure shapes and the spacing of the nanostructures, uh, as well as uh, looking at improvements in, in, in the cargo and nanoparticle packaging, uh, as I mentioned a couple of slides ago, uh, and, and hoping to close this gap uh, and, and hoping to get there um, in the near future with, it, with these types of systems. Most of our other approaches uh, really revolve around rapid membrane deformation strategies, which uh, gives us an opportunity to leverage key observations uh, made by Paul's group about you know, 12 or 15 years ago now, uh, where the, uh, in work looking at how to position molecules on curved surfaces, uh, his group saw that pores uh, could be formed transiently uh, along uh, 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 that close on the order of about minutes uh, along liposomal membranes uh, when they're when they're compressed. And so a couple of uh, years later, uh, uh, Bob Langer and, 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 and Jensen uh, and colleagues um, demonstrated that you could generate similar pores along cellular membranes and that uh, these could be used uh, to deliver biomolecules intracellularly. We're excited about these types of platforms um, um, uh, and, and, and the, the application of these types of technologies because uh, they really have the potential to achieve higher manufacturing throughputs while treating cells more gently uh, than uh, existing non-viral transfection techniques. Uh, but there is kind of one hang up with cell squeezing uh, in that that the cells are sticky and microfluidic channels are also sticky. And so you end up having a plumbing problem where cell uh, squeezing uh, constrictions can easily be clogged only after uh, a couple of minutes of operation leading to device failure. And so when you think about making an assembly line for cellular therapeutics, you don't necessarily uh, want to have to reset that assembly line every couple of minutes. And so our solution to take advantage uh, is to really take advantage of, of, of bio-inspired materials. Um, uh, that we can line uh, along the microfluidic channels to create omniphobic or essentially super non-stick surfaces. And the inspiration for these slippery and liquid infused porous surface materials that were pioneered by our colleague uh, Joanna Eisenberg uh, are uh, the surfaces of pitcher plants that uh, are able to essentially establish a slick water layer uh, on the their porous skin uh, when it rains, because uh, it rains in the Amazon as opposed to Los Angeles, um, to fail, uh, to, to, to basically fall, um, uh, uh, to, to cause ants or other insects uh, that are sitting on the, on the plant surface during that time to fall into the mouth of the plant. And, uh, and essentially that's how the plant eats. And so Issa Frost, a, a, a talented uh, MSTP student working with me is adapting these materials for integration into microfluidic devices uh, right now. And so from uh, applications in, uh, uh, for some applications, you know, we, we, think, we think about uh, designing and testing uh, COVID-19 directed cell therapy products uh, where you may need just a simple inexpensive uh, bench top or even point of care gene delivery platform. And so for this kind of work, we, we basically just wanted to see how cheap we could make a, a cellular uh, intracellular delivery device with only stuff lying around in the lab. Uh, so ESA has been uh, uh, taking commonly used uh, track etched cell culture inserts that happen to have pore sizes that are on the order uh, of uh, uh, what you would need to squeeze, uh, for example, a CD34 positive uh, hematopoietic stem cell or even an activated T cell uh, to enable delivery by essentially placing the inserts in the cells in a standard conical tube, applying house vacuum to basically direct the cells uh, across the pores. And um, in uh, more recently, she's been leveraging some of the 3D printing capabilities in our, uh, uh, that we have in the lab uh, to paralyze this batch processing method. And you know, from an initial proof of concept, she's able to, to, to demonstrate delivery of uh, uh, simple fluorescently labeled dextran cargos uh, with this platform um, to hematopoietic, uh, hematopoietic stem cells. And, and you know, this is really ultimately just a teaser uh, as this work is, is ongoing and is, is uh, 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 really needs uh, to has, has has a little bit to go to to refine the strategy. And lastly, um, I wanted to uh, uh, talk a little bit about an approach that we believe um, has some interesting potential. And uh, uh, we wanted to see where we wanted to basically see if we could mechanically manipulate the cells without having to touch them. Uh, 
So in thinking uh, about how we might accomplish uh, this kind of objective, we thought about, uh, you know, how when you go to a concert or when you're listening to, you know, a really great sound system uh, in your home or, or, or somewhere uh, or, or anywhere, um, when you enter the room, you kind of, you can kind of feel the sound. It's kind of like in Back to the Future when, you know, Marty McFly strums the guitar and, you know, he jumps, uh, uh, he gets thrown uh, uh, into, uh, into Doc Brown's house, basically. And so the idea is that if you can feel that kind of sound, maybe we can design systems where cells can feel it too. And uh, we do this by using what are called acoustofluid, acoustofluidic methods, uh, where we can couple a piezoelectric transducer to a microfluidic system. And driving uh, the piezo with an electric signal causes it to vibrate uh, rapidly uh, enough to enable the transmission of a bulk acoustic wave um, into the glass capillary. And by um, uh, fine tuning the uh, uh, characteristics of, of, the, of, the, of the bulk acoustic wave, it's possible to control acoustic radiation forces that enable you to direct uh, or really stream cells through pressure nodes established along the microfluidic capillaries that stretch the cells as they travel through the system, rendering them temporarily permeable and facilitating intercellularly, intercellular entry of biomolecular cargos uh, flowing in the, in, within the microfluidic channels. And so since the cells don't have to uh, squeeze through physical constrictions, we think this is a really neat approach because the devices don't clog and they can be operated with higher throughputs in, in a sustainable fashion. Um, you can operate them for hours without having uh, to, uh, 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 to reset anything. And so this, uh, this work has, has really been spearheaded by Jason Belling. Um, he's a, a talented graduate student in, in the group uh, who's graduating at the end of the month and, and moving on to join uh, a spin-off company um, uh, that's interested in commercializing this type of uh, uh, technology um, that uh, is based off of uh, uh, based uh, that's being spun out by the UCLA Technology Development Group. And so what we see in these types of systems uh, is, is that as opposed to the nanostructure based methods that I talked about earlier, uh, with our acoustic fluidic streaming, uh, it, it enables us to manipulate uh, and uh, induce transient permeabilization of both the plasma membrane and the nuclear membranes. And we see this in nuclear membrane rupture studies uh, conducted with Stephen Young's group, where uh, using cells transduced with a fluorescently uh, labeled um, a nuclear localization sequence reporter system, uh, uh, we uh, see that uh, the nuclear membrane basically uh, opens up following um, uh, uh, acoustofluidic manipulation and then uh, eventually, uh, eventually heals. And uh, uh, these studies are really hope uh, are, the, are really beginning to provide us with a better understanding of what's happening uh, with the cells during our acoustofluidic treatments, and, and we hope will ultimately provide insight into the mechanism of intracellular entry and nuclear delivery that we can exploit to um, further improve uh, pr pr further improve these types of technologies. And so. We've tested the delivery of different types of GFP uh, expression uh, plasmids to a variety of cell types um, uh, using the system, uh, which you know at this proof of concept stage uh, uh, had really been optimized uh, for uh, delivery to model cell lines like Dracat cells. And moving forward, particularly for COVID-19 related efforts, uh, we're in the early stages of optimizing delivery to T cell populations. Uh, Yao Gong is a graduate student from uh, chemistry who's leading this effort now and it is now starting to get her feet wet with learning how to, to work with T cells. And as a first step, she's recently been uh, looking at uh, new plasmid cargos from uh, our colleagues at Tiro de la Vera from uh, uh, pediatric hematology on oncology uh, that encode for a Cas9 a ribonuclear protein complex that uh, can uh, target the disruption of the track locus. And, um, there's still a lot of kinks to be worked out, to be honest. Uh, but uh, the uh, and, 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 and this is actually a really big plasmid, which is on the order of something like 10, 10 kb or so. Um, and you know, we're seeing uh, that we essentially, um, for these types of uh, th these cell types and these types of cargos, uh, needing to really drive the piezo pretty hard to achieve uh, decent decent delivery uh, with the system. Um, which ultimately can generate a good deal of heat 
that can unfortunately negatively impact cell viability. And so we're working on adding different types of uh, thermoelectric cooling modules and other uh, heat mitigation techniques uh, to, to really kind of minimize these types of effects. Uh, Similarly, when you know we're thinking about producing engineered cell products, uh, cell populations uh, rapidly for a COVID for a COVID nineteen response, um, uh, you're going to need to scale up uh, from our current uh, single single channel devices, and so we're hypothesizing that moving progressively from ten channels uh, and ultimately to fifty channels will uh, allow us to process. Um, um, at our current 12 million uh, cell per hour per channel uh, uh, throughputs uh, with our current devices um, uh, on the order of hundreds of millions uh, of cells in, a, in an hour, which is essentially uh, sufficient to produce uh, single, um, uh, single therapeutic doses of, uh, of uh, uh, for example, a CAR T cell product, um, which would be you know, equivalent for, for, for producing a, a COVID-19 directed cellular immunotherapeutic. Another way that we're hoping to enhance delivery efficiency is to promote mixing uh, between uh, the packaged cargo and the cells as they're as they're rendered porous. And so, uh, one way that we're considering to add uh, it, considering to do this is to add essentially modules that ena enable inertial focusing uh, of uh, the cells and the cargo uh, as they flow along curved uh, curved network of channels. And so. Uh, during the lockdown, we spent a, a good deal of time uh, learning how to develop different types of simulations to model this behavior and are starting to uh, fabricate devices based on these models uh, um, and, and, and test the first prototypes. And so uh, stay tuned to see um, how, we, uh, how, how this may affect uh, ultimately uh, uh, behavior in kind of the real world systems. And so kind of to wrap up with this slide, um, we're at early stages with much of this research and admittedly, uh, it remains to be seen whether engineered cell therapies can really make an impact in, in COVID-19 clinically. Uh, but our hope uh, with our group uh, is that uh, we can, through some developing some of these technologies, uh, we can help to enable uh, strategies for rapid deployment of these interventions when they do become available. And uh, ultimately, um, uh, uh, optimize the cargoes, uh, the packaging and, and, and delivery uh, of uh, to different types of target cells, we can hopefully improve the processing and manufacturing of these immunotherapeutic products uh, that, you know, potentially might be meant for uh, addressing uh, uh, the current pandemic, but ultimately will hopefully uh, uh, lead to technologies that we'll have at the ready uh, to address, you know, pandemics that we may, may face in the future. And so, uh, with that, I'm um, really uh, fortunate to having coming out of my, you know, physician engineering or scientist training. Uh, now that I and now that I'm branching out uh, to work with a talented and dedicated team of, of graduate students and postdoctoral scientists and engineers who who really make this work possible. Uh, I just get kind of get to be the quarterback in a lot of ways and and and, and kind of. Uh, um, uh, be a pretty face in a lot of ways, uh, but uh, it's it's really their their hard work and dedication that makes all this possible. And, and we also obviously would like to uh, thank the generous support from uh, NIH and uh, the BSCRC and, and the, and the um, COVID nineteen Research Oversight Committee uh, for it's really enabled us to to pivot our work uh, into these types of COVID nineteen related areas. And uh, before I forget, um, I promised Bridget and I promised one of our fellows, um, uh, Ashley Gray, um, who sent over a flyer the other day um, uh, up the, to that I try and plug this upcoming seminar um, that's being held uh, by NIH uh, that's really focused on emerging uh, antiviral approaches for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and uh, I thought that would you know, hopefully be of interest to uh, folks on the call and, and, and folks who are part of our community. And so thanks so much for your, your uh, attention and, and, and the opportunity to speak with you today. Great, thank you so much, Steve. That was really, really um, fascinating with all the different strategies that you've been working on. Um, I guess I'll open the floor up to any questions. Anyone with questions just wanna um, either show their face and mute themselves or write it in the chat box. I guess I will. Oh, yeah. go ahead. 
Jeff. <laughs> I think Steve does a nice talk. Yep. Um, so is there is there any concern if you're if you're inducing channels or, or pores in T cells mm -hmm. of uh, sort of altering activation status or or physiological effects of uh, whatever's in the extracellular media, for example, rushing in or 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 what have you? I mean that's a that's a good question. I think uh, um, that's where I think our, our work is 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 going to need to be focused, kind of moving forward, uh, to really validate these types of approaches. You know, presumably it's the same the same issue would can be said for for micro, for electroporation based yeah. systems, right? And so uh, um, taking a deeper dive, and uh, we know uh, at least for the CUSO fluidic system that uh, we aren't inducing much in terms of like DNA breaks um, using different types of uh, 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 DNA breakage assays, but uh, taking a deeper dive into, you know, even the epigenetic or, or other kind of regulatory kind of networks, uh, I think is going to be important kind of moving down the road. Right. And but but the one distinction, electroporation induces pores that have a half-life of the on the order of nano to picoseconds. They're, re they're really mm -hmm. transient pores. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you're inducing uh, more is more stable pores mm -hmm. acoustic uh, uh by when you're squeezing cells and maybe also acoustically mm -hmm. um all the way to getting dissolution of the nuclear membrane which is really easy mm -hmm. so so it's not it seems like there's phys there's something substantially different going on mm -hmm. um with with the way you're doing things electroporation doesn't uh permeabilize small vesicles, for example, inside a cell, it, it only hit the, the large membrane, depending on the electric field strength. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's definitely something that we, we, we definitely need to kind of uh, uh, tease out as we kind of uh, uh, move forward, forward with some of this stuff. Steve, I have a question, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm just curious, and I may have missed this, but what about aerosolizing some of these products? Have you thought about that and how that might work for these patients? Um, it's it's definitely something that uh, is beginning to to uh, enter into our wheelhouse with uh, certain other things that we've been we've 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 had discussions on um, uh, for certain other uh, gene therapy applications. Um, there's a uh, different challenges in, in that aspect in terms of uh, um, uh, having uh, nanoparticle based packages uh, um, circumvent different uh, immunologic or, or physical barriers like mucus, uh, mucus production in, in the airways that uh, are going to definitely be important to, uh, um, to look at. But, you know, it's potentially an interesting way to deliver some of these uh, uh, the different um, immunomodulating molecules or even um, uh, cell types. Okay, thanks. Great talk, Steve. Really, really interesting and cool stuff. Great. Thank you, Jeff and uh, Bridget. Um, I guess, Steve, I have a question. Um, yeah. I, I find the, the sound uh, technique, the sound wave technique that you were talking yeah. about is fascinating. Um, I was curious, do you think that would be an advantage of applying that um, to perhaps delivering, delivering um, you know, stuff across barriers, like the blood-brain barrier? Um, it's, if you can get it focused, um, I think there, there, are actually, there are groups that have, have thought about um, those types of approaches. Um, uh, I want to say, um, uh, oh man, I, I, I want to say uh, uh, Mikhail Shapiro's group at, at Caltech in particular has, has, has looked at that, uh, has, has looked at those types of systems. Um, uh, that's maybe a little bit outside of our wheelhouse uh, for what we're doing at this point, but uh, I definitely think that there's a, there's a, there are interesting applications for that. Mm -hmm. but, but I can see your point that it needs to be very specific also. Yeah, <laughs> in order to kind of get everything um, where you need to be, so. Right. Great. Any other questions for Steve? If not, um, then thank you so much, Steve, for um, you know showing us your work today. And um, I just want to remind everyone that we don't have a seminar next Friday. So we'll see everybody back in two weeks on November 13th. So, um, so have a good week until then. And happy Bye -bye. Halloween, everyone. And, don't and happy Halloween. Halloween. <laughs>
Thanks so much, Steve. <laughs> bye bye, everyone. <laughs>